Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to our latest installment of our Black History Month speaker series. Today's topic is small business and the role of small business in supporting an equitable recovery. 75% of workers over 65 are employed by small businesses. 50% of black workers are employed by small businesses. 67% of Hispanic workers are employed by small businesses, and 62% of workers with disability are employed by small businesses. This is an important sector and segment of our economy. To build an equitable recovery requires a strong and vibrant small business community. And today's guest, Deirdre Henry Spears, Senior Advisor COVID Programs at the SBA, will speak with us on that very topic. Moderating today's discussion is my friend Howard Fisher of WHUR of Daily Drum. And with that, I'll hand it over to Howard Fisher. Well, thank you so much, Gary, for that introduction. And we have so much to talk about for the next hour or so. Let's get to it. Deidre, thank you so much for joining the conversation. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Absolutely. So before we even get to where we are regarding small businesses in 2022, let's take a step back and talk about the impact of the pandemic on small businesses. We are now more than two years in, and while things are opening up a bit, things have not been easy for small businesses. Talk a little bit about what small businesses have experienced over the past two years or so, dude. Uh, thank you. So it was um, it was something else. I, I tell you, I joined the SBA in April 19th, less than a year ago. So my experience with the pandemic and the impact on small businesses was really quite personal. It was about uh, when we could go out, because you remember those early days when we were really urged to stay home and roads were being closed and um it was just a new reality, one that we didn't think, I know I didn't think I would experience in my lifetime. I remember boarded up shops. I remember when I did get out, my favorite places like not being there anymore. Uh, I remember feeling sort of like I was in an alternate reality. Uh, my favorite coffee shop was closed. I would go into other, I live at the border of uh, Maryland and Virginia. So even if I would go over the bridge into Virginia, um, the bagel place, um, one day my husband said, let's go, go to your favorite place. It was not there. Uh, so that was the small business experience in a nutshell, a struggle for survival. And we saw it in every sector. We saw it in arts and entertainment. They were um, some of our communal spaces where we see performances, movie theaters, uh, places where people gather, restaurants. They were the first, hardest hit, first to close, last to reopen because of the nature of COVID. And we had an economy that was in free fall. So, Harold, you know, you know me a bit and you know my experience. I spent some time on Capitol Hill uh, working on the Senate Committee on Finance. And during that time, I worked on things like unemployment insurance. Mm -hmm. And I remember what we call, do you remember the Great Recession? Yes. Yes, we all do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we, we were trying to dig out of that and we created programs uh, to provide unemployment insurance at record rates to help people feel safe and secure to know that they'd be able to buy at least groceries and gas. And so I, I saw what happened to small businesses this time create the beginning of another recession. And um, thankfully, some of the lessons from that great recession, when the Biden-Harris administration came in, they employed those lessons learned quickly and really tried to get uh, capital out the door, money out the door into the hands of families, unemployment benefits rolling uh, quickly. But that is the experience. I think that experience, it's more than statistics or facts on a chart. It's a, it's a personal experience of what was closed. I was a business owner at the time. I um, ran a nonprofit and I remember having to close my office. 
mm-hmm. in downtown DC and bring my uh, nonprofit home to my personal address. One, I wasn't going there. I couldn't keep paying rent for a space I wasn't using. Uh, thankfully, we didn't have to let too many people go. We were able to say, okay, everyone work from home. And as we have assignments, we will give them and we'll do this month to month um, way of existing. And it helped us, but it was also um, incredibly scary and frustrating. That's what I remember about the beginning of this pandemic. You know, you just illustrated something that a lot of small businesses have had to learn how to do during this COVID pandemic. We use the term pivoting. Mm. Everyone had to learn how to pivot. Did the SBA also have to learn how to pivot to address the needs of small businesses. We are we are talking about, you know, the federal government. They don't move as fast <laughs> as, as small businesses need to. So here's why I am uh, so excited about the work I get to do at the Small Business Administration. I work for um, Administrator Isabella Casillas Guzman, Isabel Casillas Guzman. I had a little Isabella. I gave her a little flourish, but it's Isabel Casillas Guzman. And um, she challenges us every day to be as entrepreneurial as the small businesses we represent and work for, meaning we cannot lumber along. Now, um, you've heard it's hard to to like turn a steam liner. We are a huge boat and it's very hard in the federal government to make swift turns. We are not a little, um, you know, cigar boat, uh, very, very maneuverable uh, and and fast. However, we wouldn't take, um, I, I work for someone who wouldn't take like no or it's too hard as an answer. Uh, This is a small, she's a small business woman herself. She comes from a family of uh, small business owners. Her father uh, opened a veterinary uh, business and she grew up working there and watched that business grow. So it's very, it's almost visceral with her, the desire to help small business owners. She knows that it then becomes about a family. And when I was thinking about uh, taking, accepting a position Uh, At the Small Business Administration, I come from having maybe, what, 10 years at the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, working in the health sector, and then working on the Hill, and then working in a nonprofit. It was like, small business, is is this my bed and butter? I know about recovery, but what do I know about um the, the, the business owner? It's like, well, you ran a nonprofit. Here's what I know, is that business owners that are powering our economy. So we're gonna agree they power our economy, our people with families. They are usually very, very small, like less than 100, less than 50. We have all these categories, up to 500 employees. We consider you a small business. The smallest of the small are less than 50 employees. In my business, I had less than 50 employees. You become a family and you represent families. And so what do I know about families? Like. The money that comes in, it's a matter of survival. It's a matter of who eats. It's a matter of um, what you're going to eat. It's a matter of what you're wearing to school, how, who's going to college and who's not. It's a matter of multi-generational, how the family support it. And then it's a matter of personal pride. The, The thought of making an idea real and then growing it. And so SBA had to think that way. We inherited a few, uh, um, Programs. I was going to Freudian slip and say problems because we inherited some of those too, Harold. Yeah, I mean that's the rea- that's the reality of, of moving from administration to administration, as well as uh, the ever changing dynamic that is, as we've seen the pandemic. But please go ahead. Yeah. So th- thank you. So maybe we'll start at that moment. Like we come in, there are programs that were stood up in the gap and right between the. Um, in that transition space between administrations from the previous administration to the Biden-Harris administration. Well, uh uh-oh, we didn't have a very smooth transition. 
So that means the typical handoff and conversations that would typically happen in the middle of a crisis moment for our country and our economy didn't happen. So we had to just hit the ground running with the programs that we uh, received, things like PPP, which is a wonderful program, definitely got money out to the community, but we know there were fewer fraud checks than we would have built. So then how do you build those on the back end and make sure you're a good steward of all of our tax dollars? Because we know we don't have a lot of money to spare. We send them for our taxes and we expect them to be used appropriately. Programs like COVID Idol, uh, which is the economic disaster and um, and injury loan. But there was one, we always have an idle program, economic disaster and injury loan, but there was one made specifically for COVID. And I tell you, that money wasn't moving out the door as efficiently and quickly as we wanted. Um, Administrator Guzman made that a high level priority to really look and get money out the door. We had another program called Shuttered Venues and Operators Grants. That's for our movie theaters, our shows, everything from Broadway to the mom and pop like run museum to um, your, your, your favorite venue that's sort of a bar, but it's not really a bar. It's a, they, they have live shows there. So mm -hmm. you can pick the favorite one in your community. Um, and they were the first places to close. They were devastated. And they were also facing, uh, Harold, sort of uh, predatory um, real estate speculation. Because can you imagine? Yeah. Some of these beautiful venues are in beautiful buildings. And people wanted those buildings. And so um, at the moment that I was hired, Shuttered Venues was one of our programs where not a dollar had gone out the door. And we were now in April. We had had a launch that just did not go well in the beginning of March. And we were trying to recover from that. That's the first job the administrator gave me. Like, you are my senior advisor uh, for COVID programs. Shuttered venues, let's fix it because I need that money to go to this sector of arts and culture. Um, and so we just rolled up our sleeves. We moved folks around, including personnel. We started partnering across government to make sure like things like tax data that we need to verify people's income. All of that was coming quickly. To date, we've gotten 14 billion since since April to now, $14 billion out the door, like out the door, money in hands. Um, and I smile because when you saw Broadway come back, yes, that was shuttered venues and operators grants money. And now you can't get tickets. Right. Which and is which is a good problem to have, which suggests, for example, that uh, the this difficult recovery uh, is starting to work. And, and I will say uh, to that point, so here we are now, we are in February of 2022. And as I said earlier, things are starting to open up a bit. So I'm assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the SBA must again make some changes and make some adjustments to help some of the small businesses. Uh, let, let's talk about what's happening right now with SBA and, yeah. and specifically as a senior advisor to Administrator Guzman, how do you help keep her ear to the ground for those coffee table issues? Because things are, are constantly, constantly changing. We are not out of the woods yet. No, we're not. No, we're not. Um, but we are. We, so part of it is your posture. Are we only going to think about recovery? Um, are we only going to say, okay, are we going to think recovery and beyond? Like, how do we help businesses now that we know this can happen? What if it were to happen again? Yes. So there's a conversation that the administrator has been having about building resiliency in our businesses, not just for pandemic virus or anything else, but for pandemic related,
but for even climate issues. Remember in the midst of this COVID just a couple months ago, we were seeing fires on top of fires. And then we had like smoldering fires in Colorado and snow fell. What is that? You know, um, <laughs> wildfire meets snow. How do we help businesses recover? One of the um, unknown parts of the work that SBA does, or little known, is our role in disaster recovery. We are a major player in disaster recovery, arm in arm with FEMA mm -hmm. and HUD, while they're taking care of the individual and making sure folks have a place to sleep and that food is provided and shelter. These are oftentimes business owners. Not only have they lost their home, but they've lost their businesses as well. And if the communities are going to recover, those businesses need to be able to bounce back. SBA is there with com highly competitive, highly and very low interest loans to help those businesses rebuild. But more than that, what are we what are that we empowering them to do? And that's a it's a very early conversation we're having at SBA. But one example. Um, the administrator gives is, is a business that she visited that had um, experienced Sandy and um, well, what was the hurricane before Sandy? So the hurricane before Sandy and had lost all their equipment that was stored in a basement. It was the, the right place for them to store it, lost all their equipment. They used one of their loans and in their rebuild, built storage that was elevated and away. Okay, that seems simple and common sense, but they that's what they used their loan to do. When Sandy came, they were up and operating again when it when it went out. She is thinking along the lines of how do we help other businesses be able to do that in this very precarious climate age in which we live? How do we help them say, what would make your business resilient? Is it something as simple as moving your inventory to a new place, but that's not that simple if you don't have the money, if you don't have the capital to make it happen. Mm -hmm. That's just one example of how we're trying to think creatively about our role in helping small businesses. We are talking to Deidre Henry Spires, Senior Advisor for COVID Recovery Programs to the Administrator of the Small Business Administration. In a bit, we're going to go to some questions, but I still have uh, so many things to drill down on. Yeah. But let, let's let's talk a little bit about the fact that this is Black History Month. Yes. There appears to be a lot of focus on African-American businesses right now. You see advertisements on television. How are their needs different from the majority, and how is the SBA attempting to address that? So one of the things that I um, just want to share with you, and it's um, hot off the shelf, one of our partners, I had mentioned uh, Community Navigators, that we have a program called the Community Navigator Program. And um, one of our partners in that program is the National uh, Urban League. And I am just trying to pull up. They just released this report yesterday. That's why I don't have the stats committed to memory. But um, in, in, in concert with a partner of theirs, Third Way, 2% of businesses with employees are Black-owned. 6% are Hispanic-owned, 10% are Asian-owned, and 0.4% are American Indian and Alaska Native-owned. Black and Hispanic family found, uh, fa female founders receive less than half a percent, 0.43 percent of total venture capital investment. That means uh, money from folks who say, "Hey, we love your idea. We are we're a venture capitalist. We're an idea capitalist. We're going to give you this money to make your idea real." Women-owned small businesses only get 5% of federal contracts, and one quarter of Black and Hispanic-owned businesses are, uh, are concentrated sort of in one place. We're not spread out across the, the, um, the sectors. Here's what we know at SBA, is that there are real historic barriers, reasons for those statistics, and that it's going to take um, serious and pointed effort to overcome 
some of those historic barriers. So the Biden-Harris administration has been really, really focused on equity. So what does that mean? And, and sometimes we um, there's, a, there's a misunderstanding that in order to be fair and equitable now, we are going to, that's, that's a reason for us to be inequitable in our approach. No, it just means we are tailoring and targeting to people who historically don't hear the call, like PPP. Can I, can I tell a story here, Harold? Can yeah, sure, go ahead. With folks? So the, um, the administrator, so we talk often, and the administrator shared a story she read. It was a news article. And in it, they had spoken to an, uh, a Black owner of a juice bar. And that owner said she did not take PPP because she did not want to take a loan. And in that article, it was touted as a success, that that is the way people should think. My administrator shared with me that it just was um, devastating to her because PPP was a forgivable loan, meaning you take it and then we say, ah, oh, shucks, you don't have to pay us back. That's the type of money <laughs> Black business is at any business that qualifies rightfully in a non-fraudulent way, just straight qualifies for the program, should take. That business was an example of the type of business that these programs were made for. Another example is our COVID idol program. I mean, we put out hundreds of billions of dollars to small businesses. As the SBA, we made sure we did a targeted outreach. I talked to churches. I talked to a lot of churches. I talked to my churches. I talked to a lot of small business owners, Harold, because let me tell you what the terms of COVID Idol, the terms of this loan, it was a 30-year loan, two years deferred. That means for two years, you don't pay back anything. The interest rate was 3.75 for for profits and 2.75 for nonprofits. Mm -hmm. I I lived a long time and my, my credit is solid. I haven't heard terms like that right. on a loan. And what that means in dollars and cents, like at my kitchen table, when I got to pay this thing back and, I, and I'm afraid I'm going to be sweating beads and robbing Peter to pay Paul, it, which has historically been our reality. Mm -hmm. But you, if you got $50,000 from COVID Idol at 3.75% interest, that would make your repayment once they started two years later, $50 a month. With a loan that turned a whole business around, you know, or kept the business going. Most of us, most, not all, but a business owner can typically find $50 a month to pay back a loan. Right, exactly. Right. So and that's the type of work say, we're doing. And, and I would also argue that you know, honest business operators prior to taking on the the burdens that were created by covid they they want to be good business people in, in their practices and so as a result low interest no interest quote unquote free money uh, they still want to pay that stuff back yes because they don't want that hanging over their head because it, it's just not a good business practice to, to do so. And so that, so that makes sense. And, and obviously as it relates to this discussion, we've been talking about uh, entrepreneurs and, and business owners who are in the space right now, yeah. but what we've seen, and this is again, going back to the pivot is that a lot of small businesses newly created, um, Yes. entrepreneurs who are just starting to get into the space, they may know that they may have the best pies or cakes yeah. uh, on their street 
or they may sell out the pies and cakes that they just started making using mama's recipe or grandma's recipe. But now they realize, hmm, maybe I can sell this and quit my job. But the problem is a lot of these entrepreneurs are great creators, but they're not necessarily business people. What does the SBA do that can help them become great business people so that mom's pies and cakes uh, don't fall in the oven? <laughs> Come on. Look, I'm going, uh, I, there are, there are two interrelated stories. I'm going to tell you a story about my own grandmother. So I am a first generation American. I'm Jamaican American. I'm a proud American born in Brooklyn. Is Brooklyn in the house? Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but my uh, parents, my father was born in Limon, Costa Rica to um, Jamaican parents. And my mother was born in Jamaica. And my um, grandmother and grandfather, my grandfather was a tailor, but my grandmother, they actually lived on a farm uh, in St. Mary, Jamaica. And I would go back and visit. And I think just to keep me um, humble and to understand what the dream was when my parents came to America and what they built here. But my aunt in Jamaica, uh, as my grandmother advanced in age, and was now like what we would all classically call elderly, was um, coming from work one day, my auntie. And one of her friends said, ooh, I can't, I gotta get by your house after uh, work to pick up my Easter bun and my Easter cake. And my aunt said, huh? Why would you be coming to my house to pick up your Easter bun and your Easter cake. She said, what? I bought it from your mother. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother had set up mm -hmm. a cake baking operation <laughs> in my aunt's house, unbeknownst to her. While she was at work, she had help in the house and they were making buns and cakes. You know why? because entrepreneurship is independence. And yes. my grandmother as an older woman was like, I love that my daughter's in a place where she can take care of me, but I've got to make my own money. I've got to have my own, my own um, enterprise. So I come from that enterprising space. Fast forward now to the story of, um, remember furlough cheesecakes? Yes. They're right here, I'm in the DMV area. They're right here at National Harbor. And I was over at the Harbor uh, last weekend and I walked by them. Harold, I also have to tell you, the Harbor is bustling with yeah. black owned business. Um, some of the incentives during this time of COVID are things that county executives, um, business le uh, leaders and the SBA are doing have made it possible. I saw one business, Zen Yoga, the woman said she had been teaching classes and finally said, why don't I branch out and do this by myself? And she's over at the Harbor now, black owned, but um, furlough cheesecakes, they were making cheesecakes. They had good cheesecake. Oh, you should sell this cheesecake. And then they got furloughed right at the beginning when we were going into this recession. And it took Ellen, remember, they're making these cheesecakes. They start this business. They take it. And, and, and it becomes a um, an internet sensation. And Ellen has them on their show. And I was watching that day because they live right here in Fort Washington. I was watching that day and she gave them a check. I think it was $10,000. Don't quote me on that. But it was mm -hmm. a, a multi-thousand dollar check for their business. Well, they, they have a shop that's bustling in National Harbor. They were baking those in their kitchen. To go from my grandmother's kitchen operation, furlough cheesecakes kitchen operation, it takes what we call access to capital. And that is what a lot of black businesses and business owners don't get. SBA is working diligently to change that through our Office of Capital Access. Um, and we are looking at ways that through our direct lending experience, through our experience with micro loans, very, very small loans that really just help you over a bump. How can we help build more businesses in the black community 
but it's also going to take education, Harold. And you asked me about resources. We have resource centers. We've got this program, Community Navigators, that's specifically built, and this was a, a President Biden personal priority, that the SBA pilot a program called Community Navigators to connect into community. And so one of our um, hubs that is then responsible to work with what we call spokes out in the community to get information directly into the ears of Black people. One of them is the National Urban League. The mm -hmm. other is the U.S. Black Chamber of Commerce. So our leaders like Mark Morial at the Urban League and Ron Busby at the U.S. Black Chamber. And then they fund spokes with that money that are in the community saying, OK, you need to connect this way. Walk in here and have this conversation. And we're now trying to build People call it an ecosystem. We're, we're trying to build connections between our resource centers and our navigators so that in any community in the United States of America, somebody with an idea that they want to take big can find where to go to have that conversation and be mentored to the next step. And that stuff you'll find on our website. If you uh, Google community navigators or SBA community navigators, you will end up at a map that starts helping you navigate where you can find um, these types of resources. You can tell I get excited about this. And, and, and you should because I think it'll also help uh, burgeoning entrepreneurs get excited as well. We are talking to Deidre Henry Spire. She is the Senior Advisor for COVID Recovery Programs for the Administrator of the Small Business Administration, sharing some information for entrepreneurs, small business owners, or those who are interested in becoming small business owners. We're gonna to try to help you navigate the the tricky world of that beyond those pies and cakes or anything else that you are <laughs> developing to uh, start your, your small business. I do want to drill down a little bit okay. about what you just mentioned as it relates to helping a new entrepreneur not make the business mistakes. The pies are great. The cakes are great. But the management of the, of the business side, what kind of, of resources? Is that something that the navigators are doing? Or is there something else that the SBA specifically offers to help them not hit a pothole or those kinds of speed bumps, particularly once they get access to capital? I, I want to make sure I'm understanding the question correctly. So are, do we offer, is it like, are you, are we asking about a mentor or we yeah, well, men mentoring yeah. um, and the like? Yes. Yeah. And, and we have them sometimes population specific. We have our, um, uh, resource centers geared towards veterans, veterans offices, uh, uh, uh veterans opportunity and business centers. We have once, uh, geared to women. And we are really proud of our women's business um, centers because we have opened a historic number of women's business centers this year, never before seen. We have made sure there's at least one, at least one in every state, including Alaska. We have um, um, our resource centers. We have our um, relationships, even with bankers and funders, so community development funds and community development banks to really help them understand how to provide funding for small businesses. And then also we're trying to make sure that we're able to stand in the gap. So banks, um, so we learned a lot during COVID. PPP was great if you had a relationship with your bank. There was a, um, a really well-known like community activist who was banking. And, and when I told her I was at the SBA, she said, oh my God, that's wonderful. Uh, the idle loan is the best thing that ever happened. I said, really? She said, yeah. She said, because I was um, banking with a particular bank for 30 odd years. And when I went to get PPP, they said they couldn't match my identity. 
So if you didn't have a relationship with your bank, we found that you may not have gotten people. And, and, and a relationship is relative. 30 years of banking with you, you ought to know who I am. We found that the SBA product kind of took away that bias and um, leveled the playing field. So we're starting to recognize our role in leveling playing fields and also then in helping folks connect with resources. Harold, this is something I really want to say about um, the Black community in particular. We need to work with our resource centers. I think this is a challenge for SBA mm -hmm. and our community navigators and our community uh, leaders outside of the business, like political leaders, whoever, to figure out how we're going to educate ourselves on... Um, we, we remember that big push on financial literacy. Yes. So then like business financial literacy, mm -hmm. yes. because it's not, you know, folks try to make it more complicated than it is. And it is nothing that our community cannot understand. Uh, we can understand this and, and, and then realize when it's the right opportunity. Uh, to take advantage. But we have um, so many resource centers. I want to be able to follow up with um, with the Center um, for Workforce Inclusion and just have a relationship around helping folks connect with those resources. I think that's something that we can do. Absolutely. It's, it's very critical. And I, and I like that term, business financial literacy, because no matter how great the cakes and pies are, I, if if you don't handle your business, you won't have a business uh, to handle. Yes. Um, we, we've got some questions okay. from uh, our audience, and I want to make sure that we take some time to to share them uh, with you know with our viewers. And if we can, uh, I, I want to start with Sarah, for example, uh, Sarah from Washington D.C. And she, she's writing, how are small businesses retooling traditional frontline jobs to become more attractive to prospective employees or, or employers, I would imagine, as well as um, especially those with concerns over COVID in the workplace? I, I love it. Um, so like I said, lots of COVID lessons. I don't think the workplace will ever go back quite the way it was. Um, even SBA, you see that today I am working from home, uh, which I do one or two days a week. And then the other days I am in the office. Um, so things are changing and we are finding these changes to not only be COVID proofing, but also making employers more, um, more uh, attractive. My own experience with hiring people, I looked for an assistant at my nonprofit uh, until uh, the, one of my partners in the business who happens to be my husband or in the business at that time, uh, took over the, he's let me do this. And the best person for my frontline assistant didn't even live in, in my state. And so I felt cutting edge because this was before COVID to have this virtual relationship with my assistant. And I really didn't know how it was going to work. If I were out, would she be able to find me or tell people where to get me? And with all the technology we have, her help, we're, we're I don't know, we, we went for as long as I've been at the company and she's still, I'm not, and she's still there, um, has been seamless. She could find me anywhere, uh, spooky kind of sometimes. Um, so I think people's brains have been expanded to what is possible and that there's this virtual ability. Uh, nothing will ever replace person to person human contact, but this does, uh, technology opens up some ability for us to be much more flexible. I think, so job sharing, which we talked about during the Great Recession, when we were trying to help people maintain some of their employment, is something that we're going to hear more about, uh, where folks maybe share one job. You go in two days, somebody else goes in two days. 
everybody gets paid and the employer keeps service going if it's that type of job that has to be done in person. So between virtual things, cutting edge um, in a non-recession time, cutting edge, work sharing ideas, I think folks are going to be innovating for a very long time. Uh, I may save it for another question, but one other space we could talk about, Harold, is um, my boss calls them uh, accidental exporters. So meaning that you you got intrigued by accidental exporters. <laughs> um, accidental exporters are the folks during COVID who, because they were doing their work virtually, so I sell cakes and pies, but I can't sell them in a storefront or from my house because nobody could come. Maybe somebody started ordering them from another state or somebody, and all of a sudden I'm shipping. Now I'm shipping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they don't know where the, uh-oh, now I'm shipping internationally. And it just was sort of a result of COVID that people started sending goods and wares across borders in all kinds of ways, accidental exporters. Do you know 97% of the exporting business is done by small businesses, but only 1% of small businesses export. Hmm. Isn't and that? I, and I would say, I, I do remember seeing recently a, a report that speaks to that issue on the other side, those who, not who provide the product, but those who move the product. Yeah that while some other small businesses were having a difficult time during the pandemic, these product transporters, exporters, whether they were moving across uh, st you know, state lines or across town or moving out of the country, were overwhelmed with work. Yes. And were needing to hire more people. Yes. To help this not growing, but exploding business. So, and so I do remember that. Yes. And so I think we will be adapting and finding ways to use multiple skill sets uh, to make our businesses. We're going to have to adapt as a country, mm -hmm. as a country. But let's move on to the next question. This question comes from Vera in Tennessee. And Vera is asking, are there any other groups or resources you would recommend to help job seekers connect with networks of small businesses in their area? That is such a good oh. question because some people are leaving their jobs and looking for other opportunities. You know, I think um, I think this is an interesting, and I'm going to raise it, uh, <laughs> I think this is an interesting role for, for chambers of commerce. Often they're protecting the interest of small businesses and business owners, but they really could be pushed to move into the space as more of a connector of skill. And I know they do it all, so don't let me um, don't let me downplay the role of U.S. Chambers. But I think if anybody knows every business in town. It's your US, it's your chamber. And then we have the affinity chambers. We have by affinity, I mean the black chamber of commerce. We have the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Asian Chamber of Commerce, uh, LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce. So I think we could all be using our chambers of commerce more effectively to help us. And I, I'm putting my myself in, in the shoes of like a job seeker. Uh, to know what small businesses are hiring, what they need. We know they sponsor job fairs and um, and others, but really to help us connect with the needs of small businesses. The SBA, um, as we start thinking about labor supply, when you talked about those the, the moving of materials mm -hmm. um, and the need for people to be able to go back to work, but in ways that are attractive. One of the areas we've started thinking about is childcare. And so we're starting um, some work from the front office. I'm proud to lead that work for the administrator on childcare supply. We know that that's a very uh, local issue, but also we are thinking about how do we connect 
people who want to start a child care business with that opportunity, but also how do we connect people looking for child care? Um, how do we build more child care? But also folks who are interested in working in the field, how do we resource businesses that need the help to find people that can work and also help people become qualified to work in that space? So we're starting to think it through. Let's go to our next question. This is from Joe in Florida. And Joe asks, what is the SBA seeing in terms of small businesses adopting a skills-based approach to, to hiring? Is this something that the SBA uh, promotes? I think we explained that because not everyone may be familiar with skills-based hiring. So let's, let, let's do a, a, a working definition of specific what definition. that means. Um, it means that while you may not have experience in that particular job or that particular sector, uh, you do have skills that will get the job done. And so I'm a great example of that. I had not worked at the SBA before. While I've run a nonprofit, I, you know, we definitely do work with nonprofits, but I was bringing skills in my ability to get things done from the health and human services sector, from congressional sector, writing bills, understanding legislation and the impacts. So if the SBA hired me mm -hmm. from a skills-based place, we 100% uh, support skills-based uh, hiring. And I think you're right. We could probably lean in even more with our business owners. We could maybe do some sort of focus on um, being skills-based. But with this labor shortage, so to speak, um, what, do, what do we call it? The great resignation. I, 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 I will put um, my thumb on the scale for more employers thinking skills based uh, as we go on. OK, well, let's go to uh, Gemina in California. And Gemina is asking through score, and we're going to have to uh, define that also. Obviously, Gemini has a bit of a deep dive into this process already. But through SCORE, uh, SBA has shown that it recognizes the value and talents of older workers. What other ways could SBA help educate and incentivize small businesses to employ uh, older workers? I, I have my own thoughts about, you know, you know, older workers. I mean, my goodness, uh, can you hire a more dependable group of people who are you know, dedicated, who want to stay active? I mean, that's a, you know, that, that's a whole show in and of itself because, you know, those, those senior workers who may have retired and if, if you can, if you get them in, they're, they're going to be with you. But, you know, that's my own little editorial. But, let, let, <laughs> you know, but let, let's talk, first of all, what, what is SCORE? Explain that. SCORE, uh, uh, Harold, is the nation's largest network of volunteer uh, expert business mentors. It is dedicated to helping small businesses plan, launch, manage, and grow. And it's a nonprofit organization um, that is driven to, like, foster these um, just beautiful and vibrant small business communities through mentoring and educational workshops. And so a lot of our educational workshops do absolutely um, are targeted to older workers, are also targeted to businesses um, learning how to engage with more, I don't say older, because I've started receiving AARP at my house, so I no longer... Um, <laughs> I no longer say older. I say seasoned. I say experienced um, workers. Risen. Right. right. <laughs> um, uh, uh, connect. And yeah. I, I do think just as we're trying to encourage innovation and um, we want the pie bacon, but we also want some of these young folks that are coming up with ideas that will be maybe the next fuel source a hundred years from now, you know, um, but it's across the gamut. And I think there, there needs to be, and we could probably do 
or think through a way to partner with SCORE to do a focus on uh, what older workers can bring to small businesses, the stability, the mentorship that having an older worker in your shop provides to the younger workers. They may move faster, they may be able to do whatever, but they're not to have someone other than you say, you've got to be on time. Mm-hmm. You've got to, you know, let me show you a better way. Um, you're doing it quickly, but you're making mistakes. Here's what happens if you, there is an in, there's a, there's a moment that happens in any organization um, that makes it thrive. And it's when you can bring together the talents uh, of everyone in the workforce. And I think we've got to recognize in a real way, SBA can play a role in recognizing um, what older workers bring, particularly to a small business where every hire counts. Every mm-hmm. hour it counts. So I think that's a further conversation we should have. Yeah, and I, if, and certainly I am not a, a federal government, you know, bureaucrat by any, you know, stretch of the imagination, but it, it seems to me that some businesses, there are certain benefits that could be added as there are for veterans. Yes. Okay. And, if, and if you hire those older workers, and, and I think one of the things, not not to belabor the point, but, oh. you know, dealing with, you know, senior workers who may have experience in a certain industry. OK, one of the things that the institutional knowledge that they may bring to a certain industry without being considered old fashioned or we don't do it that way anymore. There, There is a way, I think, and, and this is certainly out of the, the purview of the SBA, but I, I'm speaking specifically to small business owners that if you hire a dedicated senior who is familiar with the work and the institutional knowledge, the history that they could very well bring to it, you know, the pies and cakes, what have you. If you want to do that nostalgia month for September or what have you, they would know how the, you know, how that, uh, the the old English writing would look or, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, or for, for example, you know, seniors usually they write in cursive when young yes. people do not. <laughs> you know, yes. and so I, I think there is certainly a benefit that that senior workers back in, entering back into the workforce uh, would bring. And as you said, certainly, you know, the SBA could, could possibly capitalize on that by offering uh, an incentive. I, I don't want to hold this up on, with this part of the conversation. We still have some more questions that we definitely need to get to. And this is really critical. This is one of the most important uh, questions I think we, okay. we need to address today. This is coming from Cassandra in Wyoming. Oh, yeah. And Cassandra is asking, is broadband access an issue for small businesses in rural America? And if so, how is the SBA working to address it? Broadband internet access is primary. I mean, it is water to the thirsty right now. Um, I, I, I'm i sorry, Cassandra in Wyoming, yes? Yes, Cassandra. Um, yeah. So I worked for eight years for the senator um, from Montana. Uh, I am, I told you I'm from a big ranch back east called Brooklyn. I am not from Montana, uh, but I learned so much traveling back and forth to Montana. Uh, I learned that uh, what it is to have your closest neighbor 50 miles away. And so broadband is a real issue not just in frontier rural America, we've got broadband like gaps. If you go to Baltimore, um, (laughs) a a real urban center, there are broadband gaps in the middle of an urban place. So um, I, I, it is a huge issue. Okay. So what is SBA doing to serve it? To, to, to serve this problem. It's about partnership. It's our partnerships with the Department of Commerce. It's our really our congressional 
partnerships. Um, and it's a partnership with uh, tech giants like Google and others where we are making them aware that remember when I started the, the, the show with the closed up buildings, we yes. have all tasted what it looks like when small businesses don't flourish. Broadband is essential to that. They need to be a part of the solution. And we are certainly at the table and bringing people to the table to realize it's vital to small businesses. So that means it's vital to the U.S. economy. Yeah. And, and the the broadband Internet access rural communities or, as you said, even underserved communities, uh, you, you have to have it. There, yes. there's, just, there's just no getting around it in in the example that we were talking about earlier where where you were talking about accidental exporters the only way that those accidental exporters are going to survive is if they have access to dependable broadband yes and and it's not cheap and so those I think those loans also that would come through the SBA would would really be the the financial foundation to make sure that that people stay connected. That thank you for bringing it back to what we do, which is pro provide money and capital. It's like at the heart of what we do. So thank you for bringing it. They wouldn't even exist without the broadband, much less flourish. So we've got work to do in that space. Um, we do. Um, the administrator has started something called the Digital Alliance, where we are working with a lot of tech giants and in and, and the tech industry. And these are the types of conversations they'll be having. So I just want to highlight that for you. Uh, we are really kind of short on time, but I wanted to give you an opportunity before we wrap up to to share some some final thoughts about where we are with you know SBA small businesses and and seeing the light at the end of the tunnel as it relates to the pandemic look look into your SBA crystal ball and and share what where do you think we're going moving forward in 2022 so um SBA is walking the walk uh, not just talking the talk, um, we have over, well over 90% um, of our staff is fully vaccinated. Um, we are, have returned to work in terms of a re-entry into our own building. I told you I'm there multiple times a week and only a few times, less times than that at home. We have a plan. And so I think what this pandemic has said we have to do for all of us is make a plan. We have promoted, I think some of the money, I don't think I know, particularly with like Broadway, Broadway and the performing arts because of that $14 billion was able to come back so safely. They were able to say, nope, got to be vaccinated to walk in here. We saw major league sports that unfortunately didn't have the access to those funds, just like open, like we, whatever. With the cushion of some funding, they were able to say, wear a mask, show vaccine, like just have a plan and move more um, thoughtfully. So I think where we are is plan as a small business, plan as a worker. How are you going to keep yourself safe? How are you going to keep other people safe? And now we're looking past just recovery to what is going to stick with us for the next 10 years, virtual work, you know exporting, um, new ways, skills-based hiring, those types of things. Look at that, and then you can find your niche. And for those who are interested in, in accessing the resources for SBA, yeah. where can they find it online? Oh, please, just go to sba.gov, type in like resource, whatever it is you're interested in, uh, type it in in our search engine, and you will be well on your way. Um, there are phone numbers you can call, and we actually do pick up the phone. Uh, so use all the phone numbers, use sba.gov as a resource tool, and walk into your local U.S. chamber, walk into your local resource center, and find your local community navigator, all on that site. Well, Deidre Henry Spires, Senior Advisor for COVID Recovery Programs to the Administrator of the SBA, thank you so much 
for joining us in this conversation. Obviously, we want to uh, salute the Center for Workforce Inclusion for bringing you on to have this discussion. And I also want to thank them for having me be a part of it. Deidre, uh, be safe. And we look forward to uh, all of the things that you and SBA are going to be doing in the future. Harold, it's been a delight, a delightful way to spend an afternoon. Thank you so much. And like you said, thank you to the Center for Workforce Inclusion. And for the viewers, uh, be safe and have a good day.